Good morning. Um, I'm going to read John, verse 15, 5 to 17. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the, the fire and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you my call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And say, so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Amen. Thank you very much. That was beautifully read to us this morning. Uh, Phil's going to come and speak to us in a moment. We're going to watch a video first, but Phil... I just want to pray for you before we, uh, we invite you up to speak. God, thank you for Phil. Lord, thank you for the word that you've laid on his heart. Father, thank you for the work of his hands. Thank you for all the projects and all the things that you've called him to within the Evangelical Alliance. Lord, we just pray for fruitfulness over him. And what a privilege it is that he's made that journey down here to bring good news to us today. Would you attune our hearts to hear that? I pray, bless him in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Amen. Let's uh, burn that film and we'll invite you up. We are the Evangelical Alliance. We want everyone in the UK to have the opportunity to know Jesus. We are an alliance of evangelicals, of churches and charities, entrepreneurs, grandmas, colleagues, neighbours, friends, loving God, serving each other, Declaring with one voice, Jesus is our King. We are an alliance of evangelicals. Cheering each other on as we seek to be salt and light in the world. You'll find us everywhere. In places of influence. And where people are hurting the most. In Parliament. In Government. I got in Stradout Seon. Speaking out on issues that matter the most. We are transforming communities, changing lives, with the amazingly good news of Jesus. We are the Evangelical Alliance. We pray, speak, listen and share. Through challenging times and choppy waters, we stand together and serve each other. We are the Evangelical Alliance. Together, we're making Jesus known. What an absolutely life-giving church you are. Anyone else just glad to be here today? It's been amazing, hasn't it, the baptism and everything? It's been great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you too for those fellows who've been through the friendship course. Hope that's been a real blessing to you. Um, before we dive into God's Word, we just want to do a couple of things. First thing I'd love to do is just honour my friend Darren. I don't know about you, but I spend a lot of time with leaders. It's really difficult being a church leader. Darren, it's been such a joy spending time with you over the last 24 hours or so. I'm so grateful for your friendship, so grateful for your encouragement. 
Would you just join me in just honouring uh, Darren this morning, would we, Bleak, would you? <laughs> Bless you, mate. And I really believe, I really believe that the greatest days of, of Falmouth, Emmanuel Church Falmouth, are, are, are ahead of it, not behind it. I really believe that what God will do over the coming days in this church is amazing. I'm so excited for you. And I believe there's been a snapshot of that this morning in terms of the life that's here. But the second thing we'd love to do, and, and I, I want to, before we get into God's word, I want to infuse you with something I'm really passionate about and invite you to do something really important. And that is, if you're not yet a personal member of the Evangelical Alliance, I want to invite you to become one. Let me tell you why that matters and what you can do about it. Well, first of all, loads of people ask me, what's an evangelical? Well, an evangelical is a good news person in a bad news world. Evangelical comes from the Greek words evangel, which means good news. And I don't know, about, don't know about you, but at the moment, my news feed is full of just about the worst news I've ever seen in my lifetime. If you know Jesus today, you are a good news person in a bad news world. What else? We evangelicals, we're people of the Bible. We don't change the words of God to accommodate our culture. We want to see our culture transformed with the words of God. Secondly, we're people of Jesus. We believe that his life and his death and his resurrection was the most important moment in the whole of human history. That he's our God, but he can also be our friend. Thirdly, we're people of conversion. You don't become a Christian by accident. There's a moment where you get down on your knees and you choose to follow Jesus and you meet your saviour, just as we've heard from Stephen this morning. And fourthly, we evangelicals, we're people of activism. We want to see the world become more like the kingdom. That's why it was evangelicals who were at the forefront of the abolition of the slave trade. More recently, that's looked like Christians against poverty, food banks, street pastors, whatever we can do to see hope come to the hopeless in our land. And who are we as the EA or an alliance of evangelicals? Why? Because Jesus' prayer in John 17 is that the church might be one. We are better as the church together. As has just been prayed, prayed, we are the body of Christ. And so what the Evangelical Alliance has existed to do since 1846 is to unite good news Christians from every background, stream, ethnicity and story to equip and inspire us to make Jesus known in this land, but also to speak up at the highest levels of government on issues that really matter to Christians. Why? Because first of all, the government need to know what an amazing job the church is doing in this nation to bless communities. Secondly, because if we don't, who will? And thirdly, because there's some increasingly contentious issues that we need to speak on as Christians. Issues like free speech. Why? Because it shouldn't be a hate crime to, to declare that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. One example of that, there was a bill going through Parliament a few years ago which would have enabled Ofsted to come into every Sunday school and youth group in the country and essentially vet what was being said. We thought that sounded more like North Korea or Saudi Arabia than the UK, government controlling private religion. So we spoke up. And I'm delighted to say that as a result of that intervention, that bill has been kicked into touch for the time being. Isn't that good news? But here's where we need your help. It's especially with a new government. When the government asks us how many members do you have, we need to give a number. And the strength of our voice depends on the size of our membership. And increasingly, uh, there's a suspicion around institution. So the, e so the Evangelical Alliance is 600 organisations, 3,000 churches, of which EBC is one. Thank you so much. But increasingly, it's personal membership that we need to speak upon. And this time last year, we had about 18,000 individuals. The great news is that now we're at 24,000. It's really good news. But the aim over the next 10 years is to get to 50,000. Why 50,000? Because 50,000 is about the size of the membership of the Liberal Democrats. Bear with me. We're not a political party. We speak on behalf of the church. But if you're bigger than the third largest political party, it means that when the new prime minister comes in, they have to give us a call rather than the other way around. So friends, this morning, I'd just humbly like to ask you, if you're able to join us, would you do so? It really helps. Helps people meet Jesus. But it also helps us speak up and helps that numbers game that we just simply need to play in government. If you're able to join us, would love to give you a little form. I've got a little table um, where you drink coffee at the end of the service. If you're able to grab a form like this, it costs just three pounds a month to join the Evangelical Alliance. If you're part of a couple, please tick the box that says join as a couple. We get to speak on behalf of both of you. It counts as two. It's still only three pounds a month. If your spouse isn't here, tick the box. Tell your spouse later. It'll be fine. <laughs> if you're able to join us today, we'd just love, love to give you a few things just to say thank you. Why? Well, first of all, because I really like you. Secondly, because frankly, this just matters loads and we'd love to do anything to persuade you to join us. If you're able to join us today, we'd love to give you a little box like this. In the box is a few things. First of all, 
I'm an author, and um, uh, many of you have been reading The Best of Friends. This is my other book. It's called Story Bearer, How to Share Your Faith with Your Friends. If you've got friends who don't yet know Jesus, my prayer is that this book will help you share your faith with those, but also discover your story, a little like Stephen shared this morning. We'd love to give you that for free if you join us today. Second thing we'd love to give you is this. It's called Speak Up. We developed this resource with the Lawyers Christian Fellowship. It tells you your rights and responsibilities when talking about Jesus in, at work and in the community. Many people say you can't share your faith at work. Do you know we've got more rights in this nation to share our faith than most nations on earth? But if we don't use them, we'll lose them. This booklet tells you your rights and responsibilities. Loads of people say you can't share your faith at work. You can. You just can't abuse a position of authority over an employee. Loads of people say you can't wear a cross at work. You can. You just can't wear a life-size one because it's a health and safety hazard. So I'd love to share that with you. And finally, and for some of you this might swing the deal, in the box is an Evangelical Alliance key ring. I know. I know. It's got on the end of it one of those detachable pound coins which means that next time you needed a pound coin for a trolley or a locker in a cashless society, you will thank Jesus the day you joined the Evangelical Alliance. <laughs> Please come and sign up and join at the end. Let's pray quickly, shall we? I've been prayed for, but let's pray that God would really speak to us today. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for those beautiful words from John. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So I live in Birmingham. Can everybody say Birmingham? Birmingham. Make me feel a little bit more at home, thank you. Uh, but I, but my, the offices of the EA are in London. So what I'll often do is I'll travel down on a Tuesday morning, down to London, stay overnight on the Tuesday night and head back on the Wednesday after a couple of long days in the office. And because I'm quite cheap, I refuse to pay for a hotel. So what I do is I stay with friends in London on the Tuesday night. But because I don't want to outstay my welcome anywhere, I rotate the friends with whom I stay on a Tuesday night. And a few months ago, I was staying with a friend of mine. And it's one of those relationships, I don't know whether you have these, where I know him far better than I know her. Do you know what I'm talking about? Where you know one person in a relationship far better than you know the other. And with my friend's wife, I'm really, I was in the really awkward no man's land, where you're somewhere between a handshake and a hug. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's a really awkward stage in a relationship. And so I decided as I'm staying at their house, it's time, time, time to take my relationship with my friend's wife from handshake to hug. And so picture the scene, if you will, with me. I'm sat in the living room watching TV with his kids. He's in the kitchen making some dinner and she comes down the stairs. And as she comes down the stairs, I, delete, I decide to leave her in no uncertain terms that we're ready to go from handshake to hug. So I put my arms out as she comes down the stairs. I embrace her and I say, thank you so much for letting me stay at your house. It's so wonderful to see you. And it's fair to say in this moment that my enthusiasm for the embrace was far greater than hers. It was a bit like hugging a lamppost, if I'm really honest. And then there's this terrible moment where I kind of step back and I realise that she is looking at me with utter bewilderment. And it's this terrible moment and I have this awful realisation where I realise that the woman I've just hugged is not the wife of my friend. <laughs> it's the friend of the wife of my friend who just happened to be in the house. And then we did this really British thing, right, where we looked at each other and we said with our eyes, we will never speak of this again. Just because we have proximity doesn't mean we have intimacy. Just because we have a thousand connections on Facebook doesn't mean we have any friends we can call when the storms hit the shores of our life. Just because we're in the house of the Lord doesn't mean we have a friendship with him. And yet what I've discovered over the last few years is that God loves relationship that we were crafted and created for friendship. And as this beautiful passage articulates that Frankie so beautifully read to us, it shows just the great design of God that we're created for connection with him and with others. And what I'd love to do this morning is just share with you a few lessons that Jesus teaches us about what it is to be the best of friends. Because we need friends. We've got music and movies on demand. We've got the world in the palm of our hand. We've got fun trips, internships, play scripts and hair snips. 
Film clips fish and chips at the touch of our thumbtips. Need to lead or breed or feed your cat? Well, it turns out there's an app for that. But we need friends. We've got computers for a fiver. Cars without a driver. We've got louder, further, faster, more. A bigger network than ever before. But we need friends. And friends are amazing. See, friendship is atomic. From the nursing home to the coffee shop, from the boardroom to the playground, it's relational connections that make the world go round. See, we were created to know and be known. It's better to eat kebabs with friends than salad on your own. And yet we trace in populous places. We're strangers in rooms of familiar faces. We crave deeper meaningfuls, but experience anonymity. We dance superficially around the promise of proximity. And we need friends. And quantity is no substitute for quality. We need 5G, HD, 24 karat friends. Lifelong, fight strong, tag along, forgive all wrong friends. Friends to talk through our problems personal. Friends to call when the cancer's terminal. When it hasn't been your day, your week, your month, your year. You just remember what your old pal said. We get by with a little help from our friends. And look to the one who made friendship possible, whose nail-pierced hands bridged a chasm uncrossable. His scandalous invitation follows the most glorious of amends. There is no greater love than they that lay their life down for their friends. So... Celebrate with me the ship most worth sailing and follow the example of the friend unfailing. May we raise our game and drop our cover, invest our energies in one another. May we still be there when the rain starts to fall and accept the most important friend request of all because we need friends. And what I'd love to draw out from this beautiful passage today is through characteristics of friendship that we're desperately missing in a lonely world. And the first is this, that great friendship is sacrificial. Jesus says in this passage some amazing words of what it is to be friends with him. He says, there is no greater love than they that lay their life down for their friends. Do you know, just about the most powerful cultural story in our world today is what's called expressive individualism. You might not know it by its name, but I bet you know it by its mantras. You do you. Be your authentic self. Follow your heart. Be true to your desires. The story of our culture tells us from the moment that we wake up and turn our phone on to discover, to create our own identity and then express that in the world. Sociologist David Wallace comments, everything in my immediate existence supports my deep belief that I am the absolute centre of the universe, the realest, most vivid person in existence. And yet Jesus says, there is no greater love than they that lay their life down for their friends. In the prayer time, we found out that we're not isolated individuals, but we are part of something bigger. We were created for connection. That's why in verse 12, Jesus says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And as I've been captivated by friendship over the last few years, I've wondered, maybe we are lonely and fractured because we live in a world full of self-promotion and individualism. We've lost the heart and the art of preferring others' needs above our own. May we rediscover something of sacrificial friendship in our world today. I wonder what that looks like for you today. It will look look very different for each one of us. But the person I've seen most recently sacrificial friendship in is my mum. I don't know about you, but I had a terrible pandemic. A terrible pandemic for many reasons. One of those is I'm an author. My first book came out in March 2020, which many of you will recall was the week all the bookshops closed. I was incredibly discouraged and disappointed, but then far more tragically, a few weeks later, we found that my mum's cancer was terminal. So I've spent the first few weeks of lockdown sat at the end of her driveway, watching her physically deteriorate. But this was a woman who, as a young girl, had chosen to follow Jesus. She'd made the decision Stephen has made to to put Jesus at the centre of her life. 
so that she could know forgiveness for her past. God with her today and hope for the future. In that really difficult time, I needed friends. And then mum went to be with Jesus on the 8th of June 2020. But before she did, she did something amazing. Something I recommend we all do if we know we're going to die soon. And that is one afternoon she took her iPad and she recorded a message to be played at her funeral. She always wanted the last word, did my mum. And she talks about in this message of, of how, of how that, that God's love for her, the decision that she'd made, meant that God was with her in her present agony. But also she had the absolute assurance of knowing God with her in the days ahead. And then at her funeral, we weren't able to do a proper physical one where we were able to be kind of in the room in a church, so we did it online. It was amazing, like 300 screens turned up. It was extraordinary. And because she wasn't around to stop me, I had the last word. And I gave people the opportunity who had heard the good news to be able to respond to that good news. And as we could leave at the end of the Zoom meeting, I turned my phone back on, and there was a message from one of mum's friends. And it simply said this, Phil, I prayed that prayer with you. I believe Jesus died for me. Isn't that amazing? But why does that happen? Because a woman in her dying moments when she has every right to think of herself decides she will lay down her life for her friends. Great friendship is sacrificial. Secondly, great friendship is intentional. So a couple of moments in this passage where Jesus says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. You. Now, this isn't what normally happens. Normally, what would happen is that disciples would choose rabbis. Kind of people who wanted to be like a teacher would say, I'm going to find someone to spend time with, to know what they know, to learn from them, and they're going to be my teacher, they're going to be my rabbi. But Jesus flips the norm. He chooses disciples. And what he does is he chooses 12 men to spend most of his time with during his three years of ministry on earth. But not only that, he spends a disproportionate amount of time then with three of those men. And as I've looked into the latest science of friendship, these circles represent the various circles of intimacy that we're capable of having with the bodies that God's given us. We can't be great friends with everyone. And the latest anthropologists in the 21st century have have worked out you can have about 12 good friends. And you can have about three great friends. As I'm reading this, I'm like, that sounds familiar. It's as if Jesus knew what he was doing. But it also models to us that he knows how we're wired in terms of our intentionality of friendship. And over the last few years, as I've researched friendship, I've found that many people have lots of mates. But lots of people have very few close friends who they can share the real things of life with who they can open their hearts with, who will be there for them when the storms hit the shores of their life. And yet Jesus is deeply intentional with a few disciples. There's some really awkward moments in the Gospels where Jesus says to nine of his disciples, you wait there. He says things like he he would not let them go any further and he says, Peter, James and John, you come with me. Can you imagine being Thomas? Can you imagine being Bartholomew? Do you know who I feel really sorry for? James the Lesser. Imagine being him. You know, James, come with me, not you, son, you're the lesser. And then I feel really sorry for Andrew, because James and John were brothers. They got to go with Jesus. Peter gets to go with Jesus. Andrew was Peter's brother. He must have been sat there thinking, my name's coming. But then what's even worse, it was Andrew who introduced Peter to Jesus. I feel really sorry for Andrew. But yet Jesus is intentional with his friendships. But then there's another moment where we realise the intentionality of God in this passage. Where a couple of times, Jesus says something that would have been absolutely shocking to the disciples at the time. He says, I have called you friends. And when Jesus says this, I think the disciples would have been like, say that again, Jesus. You've called us what? Because friendship wasn't the lens through which the disciples saw their relationship with Jesus. He was their rabbi, their teacher. There was kind of relational distance between them. In fact, there's no other record of of any other rabbi calling their disciples friends. And yet, I think it's really deliberate on God's part. 
Theologian A.W. Tozer says that what comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And it's no surprise, is it, that, that when it comes to getting our head around the, the all-consuming, con- all all-creating God of the universe, the Bible gives us lots of different lenses through which we see our relationship with this God. That he's our creator. He's our judge. He's our saviour. He's our king. He's our provider, our sustainer, our healer. But don't miss this. God is also your friend. Now we need to be really careful that he doesn't become the Lord Almighty more than the Lord Almighty. But friendship is a really key lens through which we can see our friendship with God. Isn't that amazing? That the hands that flung stars into space reach out today to us in friendship. I want to say to you, if you don't know God as your friend this morning, the best news in the universe is that you can. Knowing God as friend means forgiveness for your past, God with you today, and hope for the future. But also if you do know God as your friend today, my deep encouragement is to make that friendship your life. Don't let anything get in the way of that friendship. It is a matter of life and death. That's why the image that Jesus uses at the beginning of this passage is that of a vine and that of branches. He says, if I am the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. You've got to be connected to this friendship. But then his words are really sobering for that if we're not connected. He says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you feel far from God today, my deepest encouragement is to accept the offer of God's friendship for you. It really is a matter of life and death. God has been intentional with us. Will you be intentional with him? Great friendship, sacrificial. Great friendship is intentional. And finally, God's friendship is invitational. Jesus says in this passage that uh, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And there's loads of ways in which we bear fruit as Christians. We bear fruit by becoming more like Jesus. The Bible tells us that, that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. As Stephen grows in his faith, he, he will begin to become more like Jesus. He will become, begin to become more fruity. We bear fruit by becoming more like Jesus. We also bear fruit by doing the things that Jesus does in the world. By looking after the poor, by feeding the hungry, by loving those on the margins. The church is doing such a good job to make a difference in this nation through that. Thank you. But we also bear fruit by inviting others to the party. We bear fruit by inviting others into friendship with God. Once we've accepted that invitation of friendship, we get to extend that to a world that so desperately needs it. And my job at the Evangelical Alliance is I'm a missiologist, which basically means I study how people get, become Christians and come to faith. And you know, when we asked loads of Christians, who is the most significant human influence in you becoming a Christian? They didn't say a pastor. I'm sorry, Darren. They didn't say an evangelist like me. They said a friend, a neighbour, a colleague, or a family member. Which means that if your friends are going to come to know Jesus, you are probably going to likely play the starring role. What a great responsibility, but what an also great joy. So I want to urge you, if you've not get, got a few friends who you're praying for to come to faith, I want to urge you to pray for some people in your life who don't yet know Jesus to become Christians. Because I don't know about you, but I'm sensing there is a great hunger amongst those who don't know Jesus at the moment. And I've seen this recently in my own life. By the way, did you know the Collins Dictionary word of the year for 2022 was the word permacrisis? It's a nice word, isn't it? Permacrisis. It refers to an extended period of instability or insecurity brought on by a series of catastrophic events. 
Feels like we've lurched from a global pandemic to a cost of living crisis, the threat of World War III, death of a monarch, political turmoil. And yet we are good news people in a bad news world. We are those who carry hope. And I think much of the world feels the weight of the bad news. We are those who carry hope to them. And I've seen this in my own life, in, in the life of one of my friends called John. I've been praying for John for almost 30 years to become a Christian. He's gradually getting closer, but he's not quite there yet. But I realised that we're those people of hope last year when I got this text out of the blue. If your friends text you this, they're asking for prayer, okay? John texts me and he says, got any time over weekend, need a word with the top dog big man if you can help, pal. <laughs> I was like, what is this? So I texted him back, and uh, as you can see, I'm a classy bloke, so I took him for breakfast at Weatherspoons. Other pubs are available. And so we're selling Weatherspoons. I say, mate, what is going on? He says, I had a phone call this week. I um, had a call from my brother. He says he's got a suspected brain tumour. He's got three kids. He's got one on the way. And he called me to ask me if I'd look after my kids, his kids, when he died. What would you say? I just sat there, I didn't, to be honest, I didn't know what to say, I sat there numb. And often when we don't know what to say, I just said, mate, we should pray, shouldn't we? He said, what now? Now, you're probably better behaved in Cornwall, but around me in this pub at 9.30 in the morning on Saturday, there were lots of people swigging beer. And in the midst of this beer-swigging Midlands pub, we pray that his brother might get healed. So I text him on the Monday, I'm like, any news? He says, not yet. On the Tuesday, I got, about, got just about the best text I'd received all year, last year. And it says this, no brain tumour. Thanks for your work, pal. <laughs> Do you know what? John has still not given his life to the top dog big man. <laughs> but you know what? He might be a bit closer. But the thing I realised most is that we are those who carry hope. John didn't call his atheist friends called those who are connected to the vine. And I want to encourage you that you bear hope and great friendship invites others to be connected to the best of friends. So this morning, God bless you, you amazing and brilliant church. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you the blessing you are to Falmouth. And my prayer for you is that within this church, you might be great friends, that the bonds of trust that you would build would be amazing. But also, with the relationships and the webs of friendships that are represented in this world, many people might be, enjoy, might be invited to join the party. Let's pray, shall we? Just invite you where you are to bow your heads. And the first thing we'd just love us to do is, um, wherever we are, some of us this morning just might feel far from God. Some of us might know that we just feel a bit disconnected in terms of the vine and the branches. Some of us just know some things have got in the way of our relationship with God. Maybe we've never had a moment like my mum's friend where we've said, actually, I, I want to connect with God for the first time. And so I just want to invite you this morning, really simply, it's not dramatic. That's you this morning, if you're far from God, to turn your heart to his, to accept his offer of friendship. My mum's story was that that was the best decision she'd ever made. Forgiveness for her past because of what Jesus did on the cross for her. God with her today because Jesus is alive. And hope for the future. Heaven forever because Jesus rose again and beat death. And I invite you, if that's you this morning, just where are you? Let, let, let each of us bow our heads. And if today you feel far from God and want to accept the friendship of God this morning, I just invite you in your heart to pray a really simple prayer. Say, God, I'm sorry where I've got it wrong. I haven't got it all together, but I want to choose to have a go at following you. And I thank you that you love me, that you're with me, you're for me. 
If that's you this morning, just while people's heads are bowed all around you, just, just so I can pray for you, would you just be really brave and just would, would you put your hand in the air so I can pray for you this morning? Anyone pray that prayer with me this morning? Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone far from God and just wants to draw close? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. That's great. Father, I thank you for those who've chosen to accept that offer today. Father, thank you that that as they have drawn close to you, you would draw close to them. They would know that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you that you're with them, that you're for them. And secondly, I just wonder whether some of us, as we've explored friendship this morning, some of us know that we feel disconnected from others. Some of us know that we've got friends who don't yet know Jesus. God's calling us to be intentional with those people. Just invite you as we worship now to allow the Spirit of God to move in your heart, to encourage you to be the best of friends to those around you. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. You're with us. Thank you, Father, for this beautiful church today. Amen.